Hello, in this video, we're talking about work and power. These are the two most important concepts in physics, period. These are far and away the things you want to understand, um, you know, first and foremost, in terms of your understanding of physics, they come up all the time, all over the place. In every single unit, we're going to do an IB physics. So knowing about work and power and how they're related and how we talk about energy stuff is really, really, really fundamental to physics. So let's get into it. For some, just like vocabulary language, how we say things, there is lots of different terminology we're using. And here's how we say stuff. You do work or apply a force or transfer energy. That's just, you know, the verbs we use. Uh, you know, you don't uh, do a force or apply energy or transfer work. Usually we say it this way. All right, so anyway, the idea is you can do work. Remember, work being the change in energy. You can add or take away energy from an object by pushing it. That's really what you need to do. A force is like the thing, uh, the mechanism, if you will, that will do work. So you can add and take away energy from a system by pushing it, pushing it or pulling it with the force to transfer some energy. Uh, the amount of energy that's transferred by a force is work. Work, remember, is the transfer of energy. That's the definition of work, the most important, one of the two at least, most important definitions in physics. So however much energy you add in joules, that's work. Or however much energy friction takes away in joules, that's work. It also turns out you need to push in the direction of displacement for work to be done. Um, so essentially your force and displacement, at least to some extent, have to be in the same direction. Um, we're going to end up doing some fun vector component stuff here with this. But if you're pushing on a thing perpendicular to the way it's moving, uh, you don't do any work, which will come up in some different places. But here you go. The equation uh, bakes this in. Here's your data booklet equation for the work done by a force. Remember, this is not the first equation you should think of when you think about um, work. This is a useful equation to find how much work a force does, is what this is going to be. But you always want this to be top of mind when you're thinking about work. Work is change in energy. Work is transfer of energy. It's an amount of energy change. It's final minus initial energy. This is the big thing to think about in terms of work. This isn't your definition of work. It's just a convenient way to find how much work is done by a force. All right, so that being said, Here's what this equation is kind of doing, if you like. It's really uh, the rule is that the work done by a force is equal to the component of force in the direction of the displacement times the displacement. Uh, so here's our little uh, right triangle. If we have a force at some angle, some angle to the way this thing is moving, so here's S, our displacement. Uh, what I really care about is the you know, parallel component uh, of the force. So I care about this piece of the force, the sideways piece of the force with from Sokotoa rules would be F cosine theta. And so we're really multiplying F cosine theta by S. Uh, math enthusiasts, this is uh, something you might learn one day called a dot product. Is a way we multiply two vectors together. But here you go. The IB did the math for you, and here's the result of the equation. So in this equation, W is specifically the work done by a force, or F is your force. F is the magnitude of the force doing work. Um, so size of the force in newtons, that's pushing or pulling to add or take away energy. S is, again, the magnitude. These are both magnitudes of the object's displacement. And then theta is your angle between the F and S vectors. This is actually what's going to take the sine stuff into account to tell you if it's positive or negative. Uh, but okay, it's, it's the angle in degrees is usually how we have our angles, so we'll put our calculators in degree mode. And so, yeah, this is important because just looking at the equation, you don't know what theta means. You got to know theta is specifically the angle between F and S. It's the angle between these two vectors. So, you know, again, in this example here, the force vector is going up this way. The displacement is this way. So this here is the angle between your F and S vectors. You can picture some fun stuff like what happens if theta is zero which is common, you can imagine, you're pushing in the same direction the thing is moving. Well, the cosine, uh, so if this is zero degrees, the cosine of zero is one, so work would just be force times displacement. Because all of your force is in the direction of displacement, so you get this. What if theta is 90 degrees? 
Well, this is what tells us uh, kind of this rule. The cosine of 90 is zero, so the work done would be zero. And what if theta is 180 degrees? What if you push opposite the direction this thing is moving? Box is sliding towards you and you push backwards on it, what's gonna happen? Well, math-wise, the work would be negative because the cosine of 180 degrees is negative one. You get some negative work, and I think that makes sense to me. If you got a thing that's like moving to the right, so it has a displacement to the right, but I'm pushing it this way, I'm like slowing it down, which would mean uh, I'm taking away energy, I'm doing negative work. All right, so that's how the positive negative stuff will come up. And how you use this equation, the main thing to remember, this is the angle between this and this. Okay, so let's try a problem with this. Let's look at a classic physics problem. A child pulls a sled across an icy pond. Um, icy because we're going to ignore friction. Don't worry about how the kid's moving. It's a magic physics problem. Um, okay, but so they're going to pull on the rope with the force of 150 newtons at an angle of 30 degrees above the horizontal. Oh, no. Angles, vectors. So Katoa. So our force up more or less that way is going to be 150 newtons. And we want to know how fast the sled is going once the child has pushed it 12 meters along the pond. Okay, here's an example of a problem that this energy stuff, again, makes much easier than other methods we could maybe use. Because there are multiple ways to solve this. One very fun way to solve this, we say, all right, I got a force at an angle, 150 newtons. So I could break this up into like the X piece of this force and the Y piece of this force. And so I could calculate the X component of the applied force. And I could do some kind of net force equals MA. I could find the acceleration of the thing. And then I could do a kinematics equation with that acceleration to find the speed at the end. That's one way to do it. But if you want to avoid all that fun, guess what? You could do it all real quick with energy. Um, so here's how we could do it with energy. Uh, I, because we have a distance and a force and I want to find a speed, meaning I'm thinking, I'm picturing that it starts moving and gets some kinetic energy. We, this is an example of a problem where we can use this equation about um, work. Okay, so we're going to use the equation work equals F times S times cosine theta. This would tell me the work done by this pulling force, which would tell me how much energy this industrious child is adding to the sled, um, which means if I know how much energy it adds, I bet you I could figure out how fast it's going, something about one half mb squared. Uh, so the that's the other part of this. We want to think about the definition of work. Remember, this is just... An equation to find how much work a force does. Well, what's the definition of work? Well, work is the change in energy. So what that equation will really tell me is how much energy I put into the sled. So the change in energy of the sled, meaning final minus initial energy of the sled. And I think here, the change in energy, how is the child changing energy? Well, they're not lifting the sled up any higher, so they're not adding any gravitational potential energy. They're certainly not storing any of this energy in like a spring or something. So all of that energy is going to become kinetic energy. So let's say it this way. The work done, the change in energy is the kinetic energy gained by the sled. Work is the transfer of energy. In this case, that's the transfer we're talking about. If the child does a thousand joules of work, then the sled gains a thousand joules of kinetic energy. So I can just do one half mv squared. Officially, uh, final minus initial, it started from rest, we are assuming. Um, and so we would do, you know, officially final minus initial. So they gain this much kinetic energy. So that's the work. So what we're going to do is set them equal fs cosine theta, the amount of work that the child does on the sled is equal to the change in energy of the sled, which in this case is just one half mv squared because it gains that much kinetic energy and it started with none. So this is a fantastic little equation that will do all the solving for me. I don't have to um, net force equals ma and then SUVAT or anything like that. I can just solve for v right here because I know all of this stuff. Um, okay, so let's solve for v. I'm gonna multiply both sides by two, divide both sides by mass. 
And then I think square root. I'll do this all at once. You uh, do as many steps as you like. But okay, I'm gonna have S2 on top, two times F S cosine theta over M all under a square root is my speed. And let's plug in. So really the thing to think about here is what M are we talking about? That's the uh, only thing to make sure you can picture. So let's do two times the force is 150 newtons times the displacement of 12 meters, times cosine of 30 degrees. I'm gonna make sure my calculator's in degree mode. And I divide by, I mean, I've only got this one mass, but make sure this makes sense. And this is the energy gained by the sled. I need the mass of the sled, since this is the kinetic energy of the sled. So I'm gonna do 75 kilograms. Like, I, in other words, I don't care about the mass of the child. It doesn't matter for this. Okay, and I square root all of that. So you square root all of this, you throw it in your calculator, and you get something that's round about, I'm going to round it, uh, do sig figs, 4.7 meters per second is the speed of that there sled. So look at that, just a couple lines of math to solve this rather than a whole system of a bunch of equations. Energy and work are great. All right, so that's how you do that one. Some other stuff you can do work-wise is you might see some graphs. Very similar to a force time graph where you would do some kind of momentum stuff. It turns out, because work is kind of force times displacement more or less, for the same reason then, if I have a magic graph like this, a force versus displacement graph, um, or a force versus distance graph will uh, essentially do the same thing. Sometimes this IB2 is a little sloppy about this. But officially, the area under the curve of a force versus displacement graph is equal to the work done by the force, like the force we're talking about on the y-axis. This is another graph rule that you want to memorize. If you see this graph, a force versus distance graph, the thing to do is to take the area under the curve and set it equal to work. So it equals change in energy. So, you know, you figure out the situation from there. But this is another big graph thing that you want to be able to recognize. You should get excited if you ever see a force versus distance graph. Because that's one of these rare times in physics where, like, you immediately know what to do if you've, uh, you know, kind of studied. Okay, so force versus distance graph slash force versus displacement graph. Take the area under the curve. It equals work. And last thing, very, very important thing, is power. Power is related to all this stuff. Work is an amount of energy that you change. Power, what we care about, is the rate. So the definition of power is it's the rate at which work is done. Or if you prefer, the rate of the transfer of energy. We're going to measure it then in joules per second. And this is, along with work, the other most important definition in physics. You really want to know what work and power mean. Okay, here's how the IB writes this equation, which I don't love, but it gets the point across. They're saying, um, really, here's the deal. Delta W over delta T is all we should think of as one thing. The rate at which work is done. It's a rate because it's in terms of time. Um, the rate at which work is done in joules per second. We'll look at an example of how we can math with that, but it's really joules per second is how you want to think about work, uh, where joules is like a change in energy, a work situation. Okay, so P is power. We measure power in watts, capital W for watts. So watt is a joule per second. Very, very, very important like unit definition to make sure you know. You can use this definition to solve so many problems if you understand like what power is and what a watt is. A so watt is a joule per second. So if you're ever talking about power, you're talking about joules per second. Think about that every time you say watts and you know, work on picturing that, understanding what that means. There's this other side of the equation, power equals F times V. This is very, very dangerous. Um, this equation only works in pretty specific situations. This is definitely not like the definition of power. Okay, kind of like the work equals Fs cosine theta, but even less universal. Um, so this one's really de deadlier. Okay, so this here is the definition of power. Power is the rate at which work is done. This here is like a special sometimes thing. 
All right, so don't be like, oh, I have an F, I can just multiply by a V and get power. Uh, it's really pretty specific. All right, so the rule is basically, you'll see this, you'll use this equation most if you have like a car driving against drag or a, a train moving and there's drag. It's almost always there's a thing moving at constant speed against a resistive force. And you can find this is called the instantaneous power developed by a force. Um, so it's not like a net force thing. We're just looking at one force, like the force applied on a car by the engine or something like that. Uh, you multiply it by the speed of the car, and that can tell you how much power the engine is outputting to fight against like drag as the car moves. All right, so that's really the problem that you'll use it for. Um, you want to avoid using this equation unless you're moving at constant speed against a resistive force. That's a good like rule of thumb for using that equation. All right, so I think the first half of this equation is the really main thing. The last part is a dangerous, only use it if you know you can situation, and that's when you can. Okay, so let's do one more practice problem to picture some of this power stuff. Um, okay, so I want what's the output power of the dog? I got a dog chasing a gopher up a hill. The dramatic 7.7 .7 second chase. The dog accelerates from rest. So I'm thinking I'm already picturing, oh, that means the initial velocity of the dog is zero. 12 meters per second so it hits some speed of 12 meters per second at the end of this 7.7 .7 seconds and it climbs a vertical height of 1.5 meters so what is the output power of the dog okay so the dog goes from rest and then is up at the top of a hill going fast all right well let's start with i know i want to find power so probably i'll start with the equation for power Power is the rate at which work is done. I'm going to show you another way. This is the way I usually write the power equation because the delta W over delta T thing is kind of confusing because W itself is a delta. All right, so they're, they're, the IB is doing a little bit of like secret calculus in their equation there, which I don't love. So I think about it this way. Change in energy over change in time is what power is. Um, joules per second is what we want. And up top, we want really the work. At the bottom is how fast the work is done. Okay, so change in energy uh, would be final minus initial energy. That's how we do a change. And delta T is the amount of time that goes by. The delta T is going to be 7.7 .7 seconds because that's how long it takes to do this work. That's how long it takes for this change, this transfer of energy. The dog, I guess, is taking chemical energy stored inside of its body from all the dog food, the chow it ate. And um, as you know, with the magic of biology and ATP or something, is a... Uh, Turning that energy into, uh, well, here, I think two types of energy. So we want to picture the dog runs up the hill. It starts at rest, and at the top of the hill, it's going 12 meters per second, and it's also up at the top of a 1.5 meter tall hill. So I'm thinking this dog has two types of energy at the end. At the beginning, it's got none because we're here on the ground not moving so no kinetic energy because there's no motion no gravitational potential energy because it's not up off the ground or up you know up a hill or something and there's no spring so no elastic potential for sure at the end though is there kinetic energy well yes the dog is moving so there's definitely kinetic energy is there gravitational potential energy well yes the dog is up on the top of a hill so the dog gains this much energy by the end of that chase so this will be my final energy. Again, there's no springs and no elastic stuff. And my initial energy is zero. So if I want the power, I just find how much energy the dog gained and divide it by the time it took to gain that energy. Okay, so we just kind of plug in some numbers now. They're trying to trick me or, well, check if I at least understand these equations because they give me two of these masses. I think I only need one. So which mass am I going to use? Think about it. What should I do? I'm thinking I should use the mass of the dog because I want the output power of the dog. And, uh, you know, this must be the kinetic energy of the dog, the potential energy of the dog. So I need the mass of 19 kilograms here is what I'll use. And then uh, it's just plugging in. So the final V was 12 meters per second. So that's squared. Uh, plus the MGH, so 19 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared. of this times h 
which was 1.5 meters. So that's the total energy. All that up top is the total energy uh, that the dog, you know, gains as it runs up the hill. We divide it by 7.7 .7 seconds to find the rate at which it gains that energy, right? You could figure out how many total joules of energy it gains. Divided by the time it took, I'll get an answer in joules per second. That's what power is. When I plug all this in, I get 213.9. So I'm thinking I should probably round to two sig figs. So let's call that 210. The power is 210 joules per second, a.k.a. watts. 210 watts. Okay, so that's power. Power is the rate of transfer of energy, the rate at which work is done. Change in energy over change in time is the thing to think about when you think about power. Okay, so there you go. Power and work, two super fundamental things. Think about them often, practice them often, and you will be a physics pro. Have fun.